North America is home to a number of deserts. Its eight cold deserts and four hot deserts are all located in America's western and southwestern states. The word desert doesn't conjure up images of lush green fields and extensive farmland full of crops. Being so dry, it's the last place you would expect to find thriving agriculture, and yet this is exactly what can be found there. Farming in a desert, however, is a challenge. The arid conditions mean that irrigation is vital to grow produce. In the Southwest, Native Americans have been doing this for centuries. Their hand-dug canals provided irrigation to the desert regions in California and Arizona. Hundreds of miles of these canals were spread across the land, allowing crops to be grown and families fed. But those dug in Arizona were so extensive that they had a major impact on the topsoil in the area. The salinity increased so much that, over time, it made the land unfarmable. Today, the Imperial Valley in California's Sonoran Desert is a great example of desert farming. The arid region is supplied water via the All-American Canal. This water system, built in the 1930s, connects the valley with the Colorado River, a vital source of water. With just three inches of rainfall a year and summer temperatures averaging 110 degrees Fahrenheit or 43 Celsius, Imperial Valley is a unique place to farm. The region covers 450,000 acres of farmland and produces more than 65 different crops. Having access to water all year round as well as the climatic conditions of a desert make Imperial Valley an excellent place to farm. With ample sunshine, approximately 300 days of it per year, and therefore long growing seasons, Imperial Valley farmers are able to grow winter vegetables and summer forages. In fact, they produce the most alfalfa hay, sweet corn, sugar beet, Sudan hay, and alfalfa seed in the whole of California. They also produce 90% of the winter vegetables in the whole of the U.S. and contribute over $4 billion to the economy each year. But how do they do this? It comes down to the extensive irrigation that has been plumbed in across the region. The Imperial Valley is the largest irrigation district in the whole of the U.S. It seems counterintuitive to use land in a desert for agriculture, but the growing amount of farmland began in the mid-1800s. At that time, families and smallholders could only afford small pockets of land. Therefore, in order to make a profit, they grew the most lucrative crops. These included fruit and nut trees, which are renowned for being incredibly thirsty. In fact, it takes about 1.1 gallons of water to produce just one almond and even more to produce a single ton of alfalfa hay, which is used to feed livestock across the U.S. But by growing these crops, the inhabitants of Imperial Valley could make a living. Since then, the area became known for producing exotic produce, and it lured more and more farmers to the region. As farmland grew, so too did irrigation, and soon farmland was given priority over water consumption. Those who lived in the busy cities were restricted in the amount of water they could use, whilst farmers in the countryside were not. This law still stands today, a law whereby productive land is prioritized over towns and cities. Imperial Valley is given more water than Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and Phoenix combined. Recent water shortages have caused city residents to question this system. In a world where the phrase climate change is on everyone's lips and droughts are becoming more common, Perhaps California needs to do something about its water distribution. Water levels in the Colorado River have dropped by 20% since the 1900s. More than 40 million people from seven states and two different countries rely on this river. Less water is starting to become a real problem for those who rely on it. Water levels in Lake Mead, a reservoir created by the Hoover Dam on the Colorado River, have also been significantly lower in recent years. If levels dropped so low that water flow from the reservoir ceased altogether, then California, Nevada, and Mexico would suffer along with nine cities and 500,000 acres of farmland that rely solely on that source of water. With about 80% of the Colorado River's water used for farming, the government and policymakers are determined to cut water usage across the Imperial Valley. Farmers are understandably concerned. A lack of water could destroy their way of life. Acres of crops could die fields could lie fallow. The country's food production and economy could take a serious hit. But in this day and age, water is a precious resource. So what's the answer? 
Farmers are looking at more efficient ways to water their crops. The irrigation system that has been around for decades uses excessive water. Installing sprinklers can be more efficient and can actually enhance crop production. Using sprinklers can reduce water usage by up to 25%, but they come at a cost. Installing sprinklers to cover one acre of land can cost an excess of $4,000 at a time when there is increasing fertilizer and fuel costs. Working out more money to improve water usage is unattainable for most farmers. Other suggestions to improve water usage have included lining the extensive canals and waterways with concrete to reduce leakage of water along the irrigation systems. Some farmers are converting to drip irrigation systems, some employing high-tech moisture monitoring equipment, and others switching to less thirsty crops. In 2003, the Imperial Irrigation District scaled back its water use from 3.1 million acre-feet to about 2.6 million. They sold some of their water to Californian cities. Elsewhere, landowners have converted hundreds of acres of farmland into solar farms, installing solar panels to generate and sell electricity across the state. However, most landowners and officials are reluctant to let farmland go dry. Taking farmland out of production will only add to an ongoing food crisis, cost of living crisis, and job losses across the agricultural sector. In 2022, the Biden-Harris administration announced $4 billion in drought mitigation funding. Some of this money will go to growers, with the aim of helping them convert to more efficient water usage, as well as compensating them for giving up some of their farmland to help restore the state's reservoirs. Water shortages don't just have an impact on agriculture and those who drink the water, but also on the ecosystems which rely on it. A further $250 million has been pledged to try to restore the Salton Sea. This is a large saltwater lake, mostly fed by agricultural runoff. Its water levels have dwindled so much over recent years that the ecology of the area has suffered as well as people living close to its shores. Large amounts of dust from the exposed lakeside have been blamed for significant increases in asthma amongst local residents. With rising costs in fertilizer and fuel, water shortages are adding to the burden that farmers must bear in order to make a living. Farming in the desert may be a way of life for some, but its challenges are becoming more and more prevalent as global warming and climate change continue to grip the U.S. and, indeed, the world. Perhaps a shift in crops is well overdue. Globally, there is a staggering amount of scientific research that is going on to produce drought-resistant crops. Obviously, droughts aren't just a problem in the southwestern U.S. They are striking all over the globe. Maybe farmers in America's deserts need to switch to crops that consume less water. In fact, one research project that is taking place in Arizona is looking at growing guayuli. This native shrub thrives in desert conditions and requires far less water than fruits, nuts, and alfalfa hay. Its roots can grow 20 feet underground, allowing the crop to survive prolonged periods without rainfall. It produces latex and, if successfully grown in Arizona, will be used in the manufacture of products such as airplane tires and surgical gloves. It would be the country's sole domestic source of natural, high-grade rubber. Currently, most rubber is imported from Southeast Asia. So although people have tried and subsequently failed to grow guayuli in the United States, if it proves a success, then it could be a very lucrative crop. <laughs>